was delighted to uh, get the invitation. Um, my first inclination was to present a paper that um, I've been working on with a, a number of other co-authors um, on uh, taking a look at uh, firms' uh, sustainability choices and the extent to which governance played a role in kind of facilitating um, improvement in firms' environmental choices. Uh, as I understand that my colleague Hannes Wagner had presented that last year, uh, then this kind of prompted me to, to move to present this paper here, um, which is in the same theme, which is a, a long ongoing interest that I've had in understanding um, what are the circumstances that encourage uh, and make it easier to be able to address agency problems uh, in firms. Um, this is not as directly related to sustainability issues that I know are the, the common thread that connects everyone that's on uh, this call today, um, but uh, they are, uh, I think, importantly related, as I hope uh, to make clear. Um, uh, this is joint work that I'm going to present uh, with my uh, co-authors uh, at the University of Toronto, Craig Doidge um, and Leanne Yang. Uh, this is the first time that we've actually presented this paper, so looking forward very much to your comments. Um, let's just sort of to start off, if I could, um, just around uh, you know the observation that uh, there are agency problems in firms, and one can imagine that investor activism might be an important act um, mechanism to try to create value by mitigating uh, those agency costs. And um, at the core of the, of the problem is, um, back to Berlin, mean, Berlin means, uh, the separation of ownership and control, whereby individual investors um, only own marginal stakes, and therefore uh, the activity that they engage in to try to address activism will be less than sort of the optimal amount, which would be their collective efforts. Um, we understand in terms of what investors are, are interested in when they do engage in firms, um, some interesting work by Bolton Lee, Ravina and Rosenthal that takes a look at firms choices when they engage in proxy voting um, show that their, their engagement interests can be bucketed into two broad categories. One is this issues around governance, generic governance issues, which is again, be the focus of much of my work. And the second is in the area of what you might call sustainability where the authors of this paper note that they're quite, uh, uh, more diverse views amongst investors as the importance of those issues. Um, nonetheless, uh, regardless of which of these two mechanisms you're interested in, be it governance or ENS issues, um, the general view in the literature, and I think uh, more broadly, is that there's insufficient activism. Um, and at the core of the problems I mentioned is this, you have marginal stakes. Um, uh, you know, most uh, independent investors, less than 1% shares in firms. Uh, how much effort are they going to exert uh, if they have to incur 100% of the costs and only get a margin of the benefits? And the problem is even worse than that, uh, in the sense that why would I engage in effort if I can wait for others to engage in effort and benefit from their activity? Uh, and we call that, you know, the free rider problem. I always like to use this picture uh, to kind of try to put a, a face onto the free rider problem. If you can see that picture, uh, there's a bunch of mice um, and they're all looking at something. You can sort of see what that something is. Uh, that's a bell. And there's a string around the bell and, and they're all of this idea that, well, there's really value to be had if we could not get eaten by the cat. Um, and the only the way to solve this problem, it's obvious if we can just get the bell I think we get the cat to wear the bell. Uh, but there, of course, is the question that follows from that, who's going to bell the cat? Um, which is a nice way of kind of capturing that we can all see that there is value to engage in firms. But that doesn't mean that we will engage in firms. It's the right level to solve the underlying problem. We have to figure out a way to coordinate our actions so we can get the best possible outcome, uh, which is a very difficult sort of nut uh, to crack, so to speak. And so what this paper um, tries to do is to ask whether an investor collective action organization, I'm gonna call it an ICAO, can be an important mechanism to overcome the free rider problem and in the process, increase the over level of act, overall level of activism to address agency problems. Again, could it be um, insufficient attention to governance or sustainability issues? And through that process, create value. Um, 
So for those of you who are not very familiar with this, uh, I just want to give go through sort of two examples of some ICAO creation, which met with some success. Um, the first example is from some earlier work that I did with Craig Deutsch and some former PhD students of ours, uh, where we took a look at something called the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance. Um, this was a group that formed um, initially with around 20 members. Um, it's averaged about 50 members. They collectively hold around 20% of the shares in all of the large firms in Canada. They share engagement costs. Um, they share information on the stakes um, of, that they all have in the companies. And what we found in this paper was that they significantly increased the extent of governance activity in Canada and that the creation of this organization uh, was seen as uh, creating value overall. Um, so this is one example of a group of institutional investors finding a way to work under an umbrella group that led to an increased level of activism, improved value, and was seen as being acceptable by the regulatory bodies. Um, another example, which may, you all may be more familiar with, uh, work by Elroy Dimson, um, Caracas, and Lee, uh, talking about coordinated engagements um, is just really documenting the, this, you know, quite successful collaboration platform uh, by the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is supported by the UN. Um, this is different than the CCGG, the Canadian Coalition work, and that it focuses on E and S issues. Um, it again involved a large number of investors that worked together. Uh, they did share engagement costs. There's some evidence it's value enhancing. Um, so these are two examples of what I mean when I talk about investors working collectively to address uh, problems in issuers. But what's sort of, uh, what we can point to success is there are many more examples are of failures to form and failures to su succeed. Um, in fact, this has been an ongoing problem of the failure of, uh, of investors to coordinate their actions. And as I mentioned before, the free rider problem is the most common answer, which is kind of a vexing problem because it's unclear whether that can be resolved. Um, others have pointed to costly regulatory intervention, which makes it difficult for investors uh, to get together into a group and, and to address these issues. Um, and I just want to mention these as there being, again, two different stories for why there's been an insufficient uh, level of activity of investors working in groups. Um, and they have very different sort of policy consequences as to how you would address them. Um, so that's sort of a backdrop here. What we're gonna, the questions we're gonna address in the paper are, are the following. Um, one is just a, we wanna set up a baseline model and in, have at its core this uh, classic free rider problem. And we're gonna ask whether an ICO can in fact exist. Um, will it spur an increased level of activism and will it improve firm value? Um, we're gonna to try to talk about uh, what would be the defining features of an ICO that would, would exist to solve that, those problems. Um, we're gonna ask the question about how large would an ICO get to be and would it be the situation that it would drive out independent activists or will both persist? This is not a trivial question. I mean, um, many looking at this would say, you know, it's very difficult for ICOs to form because of this free rider problem independent activists can just wait for others to act, free ride on their actions. And so then no one will even, if they're given an opportunity to enjoy, to join an ICO, won't see the benefits from doing so. Um, the baseline model doesn't incorporate, to try to kind of pin down and understand the mechanism. We're gonna abstract for the moment from uh, some, aside from the free rider problem costs. Um, and so in a second section, with an extension, we're gonna allow for costly coordination. It's costly to form an organization. It's costly to talk to a bunch of people to decide what you're gonna do, um, sharing information, dealing with regulatory issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in the second section, we're going to talk about whether coordination costs would be sufficient to rule out ICO formation or how do they affect. Uh, and then the third section, we're gonna talk about policy implications. So hope that's clear enough where I want to go. I want to start off up front by, by setting um, uh, core understanding um, and then getting into a more meaningful extension and then finishing up with some policy applications where I think there is some impact uh, in the sustainability area and elsewhere. Just to, uh, also to underscore at the beginning where we think the um, 
we can hopefully contribute. Uh, one is just providing a framework to uh, understand what is collective action, um, uh, what's its scope and what are its limits. Uh, I think there's a lot of hope that's placed on the collective action of institutional investors often interacting with NGOs. And I think it's helpful to be realistic as to what we can expect through this channel. Um, I should mention when we're doing this, uh, we um, are clearly not the first that are interested in these set of questions. Uh, the specific approach that we take where we take a look at one firm and consider multiple uh, activists uh, is most similar to the work that came out in Econometrica by Back et al. Uh, in 2018. Um, where we're again looking at a single firm, we're focused on multiple activists where they focus on single activists. Um, and this is similar to uh, the two different strands. One, we're gonna have at the core, the fact that when you get together as a group, you might be more productive uh, as activists. Um, and there are a bunch of independent activists that can uh, therefore uh, affect firm value by taking costly actions. Uh, that's similar to the work of Winton. And like Noe, we're going to introduce a, a financial market and allow institutional investors to also to profit from trading in expectation of the activism to come and whatever information they get from being part of a collective action organization. Um, so in, in introducing a financial market, um, we're going to be similar to Noe and, and many others. Um, again, what uh, differentiates us is we're going to be look at both um, activism as well as trading in financial markets as sources of value for an ICAO. Okay, so, uh, and the second place where we hope to contribute is around, um, if we think of an investor collective action organizations, what's the appropriate regulatory stance uh, to take in regards to them? Okay, so my outline for my rest of the talk is to, um, the first three sections are gonna talk about the, the baseline model, section four, we're gonna get into um, the extension. Okay, so there, if you take a look at the paper, there's got a lot of appendices and um, uh, I uh, must say you can sort of lose track of where we're going. Um, I just wanna mention a little bit of on a notation that we're gonna do here. Um, hopefully I'm gonna convey the insights through graphs and things of that sort. So you, the notation shouldn't get in the way of your understanding, but I just wanna make sure we're clear about what we're trying to do here. Um, again, to focus on the potential benefits of creating a collective action organization, we're focusing on a single firm and it's owned by multiple investors. And in our setting, they come to the situation endowed with certain stakes in the firms. Um, on one hand, we allow the investors to trade their shares in financial markets. And we have a pretty standard uh, Kyle model in the background uh, where we have uh, noise traders and we have a market maker uh, that's helping to set prices. Um, the investors are really can be bucketed into these two broad categories. Uh, the least interesting investors in our model are the noise traders. Um, and the more interesting investors are those that can actively engage in firms. We'll call them activists. Um, they can either engage as independent investors or they could choose to join an investor collective action organization and through that uh, in, uh, engage in activism. Um, to remind us that engagement, uh, which is, um, uh, for example, um, trying to talk to a firm, um, its management team or its board to try to get to change its practice, it's costly um, and it's expected to increase value. And the more that you engage in activism, the more value that's going to be created, uh, but it's sort of bounded in that, you know, increasing, gets increasingly costly uh, to try to get firms to make changes. Um, I'm just uh, telegraphing on something I'll explain a little bit more in a second, that also joining an ICO is going to change in two fundamental ways for an independent investor. One is it changes the information that they have and it changes the productivity of engagement in ways that I will make, hopefully make clear. Um, on the bottom right uh, here, uh, what I've tried to circle here, uh, this is some of the notation here. Uh, again, there are the two main actors, the ICAO and the independent activists uh, that we're gonna be focusing on here. Um, uh, they're indexed 
um, by I for an ICAO and by J uh, for independent activists. Uh, the X's are the initial endowments of shares that they have. Um, and an activist just own, knows information about their own shares. Whereas if you join an ICO, you learn about the initial shareholding of all of the ICO members. So that's the sense in which if you join an ICO, your, your information is improved. The actions, we're gonna use the word little V to indicate actions, um, are the actions to improve performance. I'll get to that in a second here, but just to notice the activist is familiar with his own actions, whereas an ICO in each um, member of the ICO engages in some activism, uh, but they can infer the activism of all of the other members because they know their ownership stakes, which is what predicts that activism. Again, there are two main actors, I think the takeaway from this slide is there are two main actors of ICO and independent activists that we're going to focus our attention on. This is just a little bit on the timing. Um, so there's a little bit complicated in the sense that the, we're going to allow for two sets of actions for the activists to do. One is to engage in um, activism, to um, have activism efforts, and that's going to take place at time one. And then we're allowing at time zero for those activists to trade in anticipation of the kind of activism they're going to engage in and their expectations of what the activism of others is going to be. So essentially, we've got trading that takes place at time zero. We got activism that takes place at time one. And then we have outcomes at time zero. Okay, so there's these three different, uh, the two main periods in the model uh, that correspond to these two different actions. And I'm gonna have to make a little bit clearer how this plays itself out. So what is it, what, how, to what extent does uh, investor activism improve firm value? The way that we think about this, and I think it's a plausible way, is that there's all these different independent investors out there that each engage in some level of activism um, and that's these little VKs, um, and K goes to one from K, that's all of the investors. Um, and we're going to assume that this activism is independent. And we do that for sort of three reasons. One is to think it is kind of plausible that the action of one investor may be different than another's because they know different bits of information about the firm, um, and they try to uh, drive changes in the firm. Um, should also note that if we uh, they were combining their efforts in the, in the same way, this model would quickly uh, become uh, relatively intractable here. So we're going to focus, and it's also quite common in literature to think about the activism being independent of each other. That's the way we've set this up. We introduced a relatively simple cost function. Uh, and this is to just make sure that um, we don't have um, we bound the level of activism that investors engage in by making quadratic costs around that and allowing for investors to have different levels of productivity. But just think about this as a way of making sure that, you know, it gets increasingly costly to get a unit of outcome that you would like to achieve. Um, and then what does an ICO change things? And the way we think about this is that if you join in with other investors to try to drive changes in firms, um, that you're gonna become more productive as an activist. So think about each ICO member brings in, comes with their own idea of an activism technology. They all engage in these activism technologies, but they get to share the costs. Um, and like this is, a, this is an important assumption that we have, which makes it more productive to engage in activism through an ICAO. So let me give you one example drawn from my experience talking to investors in the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance. One reason why investors would often tell me that they wouldn't engage in activism um, against an issuer uh, um, was that they're talking to issuer X and say, look, we think that you've got... Um, your, your CEO is engaging in foolish projects, if that same CEO was also buying 
um, investment banking services from your firm, um, that wouldn't be good for you. So think about an, uh, a, an asset owner being an asset manager, like a bank-based asset manager. Think of a large Swiss bank um, that has asset management arm, but also has an investment banking arm. Um, if you're seen as like leading the charge to improve governance in companies, the uh, manager might very well steer all investment banking activity to some other bank aside from yours. Um, an advantage of working in an ICAO is it's no longer that you that's leading the charge. The, the person who's ever in charge of the ICO can say, we think this is the problem with your company. So in effect, you're spreading the costs that the firm might impose on you for being active across all of the members of the ICO rather than having all the costs focus on one member. Um, we think this is a plausible assumption. It's an important assumption that there is an, some form of effective cost sharing uh, within an ICO. The second part that we want, so we then, if we have this very simple setup, um, we can now easily sort of specify what is the optimal amount of activism that would take place in, in period one. Um, I think it's easiest just to think about this starting off with like an independent activist um, who has now YJ shares. This is their initial endowment of X shares plus some sort of trading, which we're gonna capture by theta. Um, and so they've accumulated Y shares. In the end, the profit that they will get, whatever the firm value works out to be multiplied times their stake in the company, and then they have to consider their costs of improving firm value, which is whatever level of effort that they um, uh, put into the firm, taking into account the efforts of others. Okay, so they're trying to maximize their profit. This obviously has this kind of classic free rider problem here is that we are only making efforts reflecting our sort of small stake that we have in the company uh, and we're taking the actions of others as given. Now, an ICO, because they share information about um, their stakes that they have in companies, um, it can act as if it was a single investor. We're now with shares of Y, which is gonna be equal to the sum of all of the shares of, um, for one to big I, all of the shares of the ICO members. Um, and they're gonna maximize the same thing, but now that again, this is a still a marg marginal stake. It's not a 100% stake. So we still have a free rider problem, um, uh, but they're gonna have a bigger stake in mind when they decide how much activism to engage in uh, because of this cost sharing. So they're gonna engage in a higher level of activism than they would otherwise. Um, just to note, we haven't eliminated the free rider problem. Um, we've actually, uh, it's still there. And also just to note um, that we're gonna, as I mentioned here, there's gonna be more activism because the members are sharing their activism costs. That's, we're baking in a benefit for an ICO for, uh, formation through this channel. So that's one benefit that we have in our setting. And we think that's a, a, an important one. There's also a second benefit um, which is that if you can, by joining an ICO, you can infer the actions of others. You can be better positioned to make profits through financial markets from trading. So if you know that there's going to be more activism than the market thinks, you would buy that company. If you know there's going to be less activism in that company than the market thinks there is, you would be able to sell shares in that company. Um, and so to kind of capture that, we do in this trade in this period zero. Um, and just to remind you, if people haven't taken a look at this Kyle models for a while, um, trading is driven here by the extent of the information advantage that you have. And the information advantage is the difference between what your private information is and what the public's prior expectation is um, about your private information. So, the greater the information advantage, the more trading profits that you will be able to make uh, in this model here. Um, and so independent activists know their own endowments. They know their own protected activism, which is gonna have an impact on value. They're gonna trade based on that. The, the key thing here is that by joining an ICAO, 
uh, ICO members are effectively more informed because they know not only about their stakes, but they know about the stakes of all of the other investors. Um, they can better predict firm value. There's higher profits that they're going to make as a consequence. And so um, it's not unlimited higher profits. The market is smart. If they realize there's lots of informed traders that are acting in markets, well, then market liquidity goes down and it makes it harder for you to profit on the basis of your information. We're going to capture all of that in period zero. Um, and that sort of makes the model a bit more complicated, but I hope I've conveyed the in information, the intuition here. Um, and I just wanted to note that the, the way we're trying to be careful here and the type of information sharing that we're talking about, which is sharing information about initial endowments is not something that is likely to get regulators concerned about. Um, regulators are often concerned when a group gets together and they act in concert, because that could be the step towards a takeover, for example. Well, this isn't a step towards a takeover. This is just sharing information about our initial endowments. Individual investors are allowed to act independently of others. Okay, so, um, we have set up the, the basic framework here. I want to kind of move relatively quickly to, to the kind of the kind of equilibrium that comes about at the end of the day here. You need to figure out what's the equilibrium level of activism period one. What's the what's the trading that takes place in period zero? Um, and again, if one goes through the the math of this here, um, there are two elements here that you have to think about your benefit and cost, and you have to think about the externality come from the actions of others. This is true for both for independent activists and it's also true for the ICAO. So I'm just, we still have free riding is still embedded in what we're gonna be talking um, about here. Um, let's just talk about the period zero trading game here. Um, and there's like just two parameters that um, alpha and beta that show up in these uh, models, which I think are important. Uh, and in this situation, so they describe how actively do you trade based upon your information. And the um, trading aggressiveness for the independent investor is beta and the trading aggress aggressiveness for the ICAO is alpha. And you can compare these two terms and you're gonna automatically see that alpha is always gonna be greater than beta, which is what you would expect because um, the ICAO has more information. Um, and this trading aggressive will be reduced when there's more illiquidity in the market. And the illiquidity is captured by this thing called Kyle's Lambda, which basically says, again, if I know there's more informed trading taking place in the market as a market maker, um, that's going to affect the extent to which I'm gonna update prices and your ability to profit. Here's trying to like distill the model to some sort of the key driving features. First thing that we're trying to do here is using um, a numerical example that we think is plausible to talk about how does ICO uh, formation affect um, profits of the um, ICO member as well as the other independent investors. I here is equal to the number of members of the ICAO. So as we get more members, we see that value goes up, value increases when we have more ICO members. And there's more activism that gets engaged in, that's gonna drive improvements in value. But I wanna also draw your attention to, to here is the trading aggressiveness. Um, alpha, which is the ICAO, and beta, which is the independent activists that because AICO members are more informed, they're gonna trade more aggressively. There's always a gap between these two figures, these two lines here, but you see that it gets reduced over time as the, reduced as the ICO gets more and more and more members. That's because we get more informed trading, there's increased illiquidity in the market. And so while you continue to be more informed, your ability to profit from being more informed declines over time. That's an important, this is a, both a benefit to being an ICO member, but it's also a cost uh, to being an ICO member uh, that starts to grow over time because this Kyle's Lambda illiquidity 
increases as we have more members. And this is the kind of key moving part. Um, again, I don't want to get lost in the algebra here, um, but just again, in terms of it, to pin down how big an ICO is going to be, we're going to look at three things. How much effort you're going to do, so how much value you're going to get, the actives, acts of others, and there's also going to be some sort of trading costs that kick in. So there's your actions, which are going to be affected by your productivity. There's going to be the actions of others. And then there's going to be some trading costs. And if we compare these between an independent activist and in the ICO, there's going to be differences here. Um, that the trading costs are going to start to grow for an ICO as it gets larger, uh, which is going to give a benefit to an independent activist. So it's going to, in some sense, limit the size of the ICAO. Um, and so here, just to try to capture this and, and put it into a figure, I'm going to try to map the profits per ICO member. And this is the profits of an independent activist. And how they're affected by having more or less ICO members. In both cases, their profits go up if there's more ICAO members. Um, but there's a different slope to these two diagrams here. And that effectively, there's an increased slope here and it gets sort of reduced here um, because as ICO gets increasingly bigger, there's bigger trading costs that they're gonna incur um, that are gonna kind of bring this thing down. Um, so there's, again, the trade-off is there's more value creation, more trading profits, but there's a growing decline in the trading profits coming from that illiquidity. Whereas if we look at Independent activists, again, the more activists, more value creation, but there's a somewhat weaker decline in trading profits. So we can now pin down how big an, whether an ICO will form and how big it will be, um, because what the marginal ICO member does is looks at what their profits are going to be if they join the ICO compared to what their profits would be if they didn't join the ICO. And so we got some, some um, uh, notation here, but it kind of captures this. This is the profits um, to uh, being an ICAO. This is the profits to being an independent activist. Down here in this region, join an ICAO because you're gonna always have higher profits. In this region here, don't join because the dash line, the independent activist profits is bigger than the ICO profit line. And that pins us down in this situation to about more than 50 investors. Um, but the fact is that ICOs will join. They immediately see a benefit to joining an ICO because of the improved productivity and the trading profits. That declines over time and it gets limited and that in equilibrium, in fact, being an independent activist is a bit more profitable than joining an ICAO. So um, uh, there's another way just to express this, um, which is, this is the graph I just showed you, which I think showed the profits. This is the benefit function. It's, it's the same way of showing the same thing. It's always profitable. There's always a benefit to joining an ICAO. As soon as you start with one, you're gonna quickly get up to 52. But then after you get 52, stay an independent activist. Okay, let me sum up where I've come so far in case I've lost some of you along the way here. We've set up a model with a classic free riding problem. It, you would think it might be an insurmountable obstacle to ICO formation. We show that so long as an ICO possesses two advantages, one simply sharing information so that they have trading profits. And secondly, having more productive cost sharing, we will have ICO formation, um, but we will also always have independent activists. We're never gonna squeeze out independent activists uh, because they can at one, some point, we can always free ride and benefit from that free riding. And the underlying idea here is that 
we want this ICO formation because it's going to add value um, because being more active is going to lead to reducing uh, these governance problems. So that's the kind of core idea that uh, in terms of setting up a framework. Um, at the end of the paper, we talk about costly coordination and we do this because lots of ICOs fail to form and um, why do they fail to form? And so we're gonna think meaningfully about coordination costs. Um, it's costly to set up an organization. There's these legal and regulatory costs to setting it up, but you also have to have set up infrastructure for communication, for the security of, of information being transmitted, et cetera, et cetera. And there are also variable costs. Um, the more people that are in a collective action organization, the higher those costs are likely to be. There's also increasing regulatory costs. Um, and so we're going to allow these to take place um, and see how this affects the outcome that we talked about earlier. And it interests, leads to some interesting new results. I would say the, the least interesting of those results are coordination costs are big enough. Well, ICOs just won't form um, because the benefits will never outweigh the costs. But what is quite interesting is if we allow for what we call a moderate level of coordination costs, then we can have an ICAO that forms, but it's not going to be the smooth formation that we talked about before. Um, we're going to actually have multiple equilibria where either we end up with zero members or we end up with, in this case, a quite a large number of members. To convey this, this is just this benefit function which compares the profits of being an ICAO member compared to being an independent activist. There's this range below zero. You would never join if there's only a couple people that get together and say, hey, let's get together to try to solve our problems. The coordination costs overwhelm any potential benefits. You're never going to join. It's only if you get enough members to join that crosses this sort of bar here that net benefit function becomes positive, that we're able to get an ICO to form, in which case we get the same logic we did before and we end up with around 35, 36 members in this, in this example. So the key thing that comes about this is that there are multiple equilibria. It's not a smooth situation here. It's really fragile in that you will never be able to get an ICO to form unless you get lots of them to simultaneously move at the same time, which allows us to overcome these significant coordination costs. And just notice here, the barrier to formation is coordination costs, not free riding. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to note from this is that we find that really small changes in coordination costs can lead to a, a dramatic increase in the ICO formation and their activity. If we think ICOs are therefore valuable, it tells you that working on the coordination cost angle might be an important mechanism to actually spur lots of activity that we're not otherwise seeing. Um, we have a graphic to kind of convey that insight here, um, which this is taking a look at fixed versus variable costs. Um, and we see here that if we can shrink the fixed costs, we have no ICO formation if costs are above this, but if we finally get costs to be low enough, all of a sudden we go from zero to like 25 members. The same here, if we can shrink those costs, we all of a sudden go from zero to like um, 27 members, right? So small changes in coordination costs can drive big changes in value. So let me kind of wrap this up in the sense that uh, what this framework helps to do, I think this framework really helps me to understand this previous work that we've done um, in showing that, um, uh, that it, in order to get these things to, to, to function, there needs to be some player to get us over this initial obstacle. Um, in the case of the Canadian coalition, there was a shock that, that, that uh, affected all firms. Um, there was a reduction in regulatory costs. And critically, we had a situation with two lead investors with credibility that were able to get 24 people to announce to form this all at once. That organization included some significant information sharing with a critical role of the central organization to gather information and there was effective cost sharing. 
Um, if we think of the, uh, the coordinated engagements under the UN per PRI, I think it's important that there was effective subsidy of the creation of the organization by the UN and role of lead investors in, um, uh, in engagements. Um, there was some cost sharing that took place. I'm not sure about the information sharing and how it takes place under the UN PRI. Um, uh, I am kind of running out of time here. So let me just, just mention two other, what we think implications from this. Why would you care about this if you're interested in environmental and social issues? Well, one reason to think about this is to think about ICAOs as a mechanism to spur improved governance. And even if you're really, you really only care in the end about E and S, since governance is very important to create the founding conditions for institutional investors to drive E and S policy, you should be care about ICOs because it's a mechanism to increase uh, G, which will have a long-term impact on E and S issues. That relates to my earlier work. Um, it also might shed light on what I, I'm putting down as facts, but I'm like, you know, it seems that it's easier to form investor collective, collective action organizations around E and S issues than it has been around G issues. I'm not sure that's true, but this is my sort of reading of when I take a look at examples of successful organizations in recent years. Um, and my ultimate reading of this is that that is probably because of the effective reduction in coordination costs that's come about by the involvement sometimes of non-governmental actors like the UN, which have reduced the coordination costs for institutional investors to do what they wanted to do in the first place. Um, and so, uh, you know, by subsidizing, by reducing coordination costs, it suggests it's an important mechanism that might spur more and more activity. The second thing is the value of third party actors um, to help to spur the activity of multiple investors at one point in time. So this is sort of a coordination cost story, but again, um, what I was telling you is that you need to, in this case, it's not enough for two investors to talk to each other. You have to have at least 15 or 20 in order to be able to overcome that initial barrier. And, and that's another thing that a, a third party can provide uh, value to. Um, also in the ENS space, I'm sort of thinking about this paper underscores that um, one reason why folks would join a um, collective action organization is they think that they're gonna be able to profit from trading opportunities. And so it relates to, uh, you would like the activities to focus on ENS activities that are related to long-term value um, are gonna be important for ICO formation. Okay, so, um, Overall implications of the paper are that I think it suggests benefits to ICO formation. Um, it suggests costs to any regulatory obstacles to ICO formation, even suggests there would be benefits to subsidizing rather than regulating uh, ICO activities. So this is productive activity of NGOs, for example. And it's a very different perspective than comes from a focus on concerns about common ownership, which is leading to more regulation of investors and coordinated actions. That focuses on the costs rising from investors working in concert in product markets. And what I'm underscoring here is that there's really a huge potential benefit from the coordinating to do the good things, which are to address agency costs, which affects all firms. Um, and so suggest this is an important issue when it comes to those regulatory issues. So um, just wanna conclude. Uh, what have we done in the paper? Um, one is we've started off with a classic free rider problem, and we found that's not an insurmountable obstacle to getting more effective investor activism through an investor collective action organization. We've highlighted two uh, conditions that would be enough to get an ICO to form and be effective. It just needs to find some way to share information on initial ownership stakes and to have some effective cost sharing. And the third is that its coordination costs have to be moderate. Um, uh, we will have an ICO form along with independent activists and the ICO is gonna add value. And then I think the most interesting implication of this is that there's the potential for multiple equilibria and we can think about what can be done in order to focus on the um, better equilibria in the sense of with ICO formation, 
uh, with the improved value that comes from that. I think that's, that's a fair question. Uh, so when we took a look at the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance, all these investors are, are getting into a room. If you share information on how big your stakes are, um, I think it's meaningful to, I think it's easier for them to predict how active are these guys going to be, or will they be there? For example, if a proxy vote comes up, mm -hmm. um, are the votes going to be there in order to force the change? And if you know how many people are in your group that are going to all stand on the same side on this issue, well, you, you would have a better idea of this. So um, we, I should say, we looked in our paper to see whether there was evidence of um, movements of shareholding in anticipation of these engagement meetings that the ICO would form. We did see changes in shareholdings. They weren't statistically significant, but they were moving in that right in the direction of what our model would suggest, um, which again, you know, if there's 50 people in a room, we realize we have to go after um, uh, BP on this issue. And we now I know because I've got all the folks in the room here are all going to vote on the same side of that issue. It's much more likely that BP will, you know, make the change that we would expect them to. And if we think that's value enhancing, well, then we can profit on the basis of that. Um, I think it, it, it's a little bit dependent upon the ability to transmit that information from who's ever involved in this collective action organization down to the sort of portfolio managers. And that may be an obstacle to, to doing that effectively. Just the way these institutions usually invest, that's a pretty sort of, you know, sophisticated, uh, dynamic way to invest. And, and I'm not saying they can't, but that's not generally the impression that I have that, that sort of pension funds, for example, operate very often. So I was just looking whether you had some, some examples of that happening in mind. Yeah, so I, again, I just point to one example in our paper when we took a look at this. We saw movements in that direction. It was never statistically significant, but was movements in that direction. Um, if you know that there's an, like in a UNPRI is an effective mechanism for coordinated engagement, more people are joining that organization, it's more likely when you decide we're going to go after X, that X is going to happen. Um, I guess it does suggest if there's better communication within that the asset manager across its various teams, that will be a more pronounced effect. Um, and actually having that kind of relationship, which we think is bad in the common ownership setting, but would be good in this setting to like share that information to give them an added opportunity. That's what it says. Uh, thank you, excellent presentation. So just one question, so how does, um... How does your setting relate to uh, prox the proxy advice? So I would think of proxy advice as a little bit similar to this uh, coordinated efforts because they give some advice, uh, I don't know, or, or make suggestions about how um, investors could vote. And that's some kind of, they coordinate, especially the, the, the smaller shareholders maybe that follow this, directly follow this investment advice, maybe this uh, voting advice. No, that's an important, there are multiple different coordination mechanisms that can help to address the free rider problem. Anything that reduces, uh, that makes it easier for investors to coordinate their behavior is going to lead to more um, uh, activity. So the underlying logic is exactly the same. In my experience, there's a difference, one important difference between an ICO and a proxy advisor is that um, proxy advisors are generally a bit more reactive and ICOs can be more proactive in the sense that you're only going to get a proxy when an investor has decided this is usually what happens. There's lots of private engagements to try to drive some change. When they're ineffective, then you go and try to put something onto the proxy in order to drive that change. And so um, ICOs can sort of be a little bit more leading in terms of identifying things that are interesting and important, uh, trying to push those changes, often working through private channels, um, rather than relying on this additional, if you go through the ICO route, so again, proactive versus reactive, that's certainly what we saw in the case of the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance. Uh, 
There also are uh, in the additional costs we think about from growing the proxy advisor route in the sense that there's the cost of uh, putting the proxy, there's much more of a public battle that takes place. And that public battle raises kind of reputational costs for the institutional investors. Again, the bank-based asset managers kind of hate that because then they have to go on the record as saying they're against the, you know, the management team uh, X. Um, but, you know, in the absence of an ICAO, I think proxy advisors are really important. Mm. In the presence of an ICAO, proxy advises, the advisors, the coordination they provide becomes less important, right? So if we had a world where the, I would say the regulatory um, stat, the way that they approach ICAOs was a bit more enabling, they would have less uh, uh, channels through the proxy channel. So I do, in some sense, they're competing mechanisms. Um, I think ICAO has certain advantages relative to proxy advice. Um, uh, but you know they both can coexist. Obviously, we don't try to introduce proxy advice in this this model. It just would get more uh, more complicated. But but I think that's uh, they're both getting at the same underlying issue. Maybe one one uh, just one follow up. I mean, I had the you had on one slide you said that um, votes on uh, or the ICAO is more successful in ES and uh, rather than in the governance perspective. So from my experience, I rather have the impression that more, more often these uh, environmental and sustainability related issues in these proxy contests get rejected. So rather the governance issues are uh, successful. Uh, exactly, the, exactly the opposite, because very often, I mean, very often um, investors say they don't want to make, um, they want to have some change, but uh, they don't want to really um, make uh, or give management an advice how exactly this change should happen. I think that's, um, uh, you're not wrong by the data. The data suggests that the level of, of investor support for ENS proposals is less on average than there has been for most governance proposals, um, which also is consistent with this Bolton um, uh, Ravina uh, paper, exactly, yeah. uh, which shows that there's more of a a divergence of views on the sustainability dimension than there is on the governance dimension. So these things line up. What, um, so again, if we think about going through the ICO route versus a proxy advisor route, there's two different channels to do the same thing. It may be easier to do an ICAO on, um, and maybe be easier to form an ICAO of like-minded investors um, and work through that channel than through the proxy advice, because proxy advice is kind of the median voter of all investors, where an ICAO is not the median voter of all investors. It's, you know, might be the investors that care about those issues. I haven't thought through this, and in, interestingly, I, I made a note of that, because I think it's actually something interesting to think about, it. particularly, you know, maybe easier for an ICAO to form with a divergence of views. Um, and again, if, I don't know, but when I take a look at the number of investor-led initiatives that are trying to get groups together to drive change in companies, there's many, many that we can think of, not only under the UNPRI, but there's lots of other ones, um, where if we take a look at the action of investors to work together in a group to drive governance change, there's actually not very many of those. So uh, it's a really good, I made a note of that. I think that the uh, next draft will have to think a bit more about that. I think it's a very helpful point. Thank you. This sort of relates a little to Julian, your comment. This is a link relates to Nicholas's comment is that our coordination costs greater around sustainability issues than governance issues. Um, in terms of, I guess, what are those coordination costs? So one set of coordination costs are the regulatory costs that you're worried that people are acting in concert for some other benefit. Um, if you're trying to deal with climate change concerns, it seems that those regulatory costs would be lower. Um, second issue is around competitive concerns. So I don't want to share my information about my view about the company's governance choices, like, for example, the suitability of the CEO for the firm's um, challenges that they're facing. I may have a, maybe that's part of what makes me a better portfolio manager than the portfolio manager next door to me. Um, uh, those are things that are, I think, are more costly in the kind of governance realm than would be in the environmental realm. Um, I think, I mean, just following up on Nicholas's comment that there, 
it is that common is also true is that there's more of a divergence of views to sort of get people looking at the same set of facts to decide that that's material. That's maybe a harder problem because people have different weights that they think on the, the you know, the speed with which um, uh, carbon will be priced. So that, that's a difference of view that may lay in the backdrop. So that's a, so I'm not, I guess I'm not quite sure to me where the coordination costs will be larger. Um, but can I just sort of bounce it out to you guys? There, do you see lots of examples of in the in the sustainability area where there are groups of investors that are working collectively to try to solve problems? And if so, what are the you know what are the examples that come to your minds? So this is much more your area of focus than my own. Um, I mean, it's nice paper on coordinated engagements under the UNPRI is one. Um, what do you see as being the more successful investor-led initiatives where they group together? to try to drive change. I, you know, I guess SASB, which is another mechanism which is trying to drive disclosure might be another one. So one example in Switzerland is uh, there's a club called SVVK. And those are sort of the five or six largest institutional investors within Switzerland who've banded together. And I mean, they do engagement so through a provider I forgot which one it was. Um, and uh, so, so and, and that is explicitly for the purpose of, you know, doing, doing something sustainable. Um, so I wouldn't, so there my impression is it's very much a kind of a lowest common denominator, right? Sort of they, they're all under some, some level of political pressure uh, to do something, right? And they figured, okay, Engagement is, is a pretty low cost uh, way, you know, that, you know, at the end of the day might actually achieve something. And if we share the cost, it's even cheaper. So that, that's a little bit my reading of, of, of that setup. Um, um, and what they, so, it, it, so I think there they have really a convergence of use. They're sort of all pretty low key, right? They don't wanna, they don't wanna cause a ruckus. Uh, they wanna be seeing, they wanna be seen as doing something. That they and that they can share and show, um, and uh, yeah, and so so and that relates a little bit also to my earlier comment. So I think the the value for them, the way I see it, is mostly sort of this reputational gain that they can really point to something. Look, we're part of the club. We're the biggest, and we're doing X um, uh, because they'd much rather do that than sort of excluding certain firms or or doing other things that are sort of you know more difficult perhaps for them. That's a little bit, so that's just one example that comes to my mind uh, that we have here in Switzerland. Are there any, getting, you know, again, you take a look at all this. I mean, do you, of all the other initiatives that are out there, so what do you see as being useful or important? I, mean, I mentioned SASB, uh, finding some way that's in the, you know, the American context to, to drive um, uh, increased disclosure or integration of environmental um, uh, disclosures with your financial disclosures. That's a, a, a bigger group of investors that try to get together to do that. Um, you know, the uh, other initiatives out there, other effective mechanisms of coordinating behavior. I think this is actually important uh, for driving, getting investors to be a part of the solution in terms of driving better governance choices, which I think environmental and social choices are better governance choices. And um, the, you know, how can one make investors more effective is I think is an important question. Um, and there are multiple channels as to Nicholas's comments here, but I think this is an underexploited mechanism. And I think the regulators have often got this wrong. So that's kind of the message I would say at the end of the day, if there's one story that kind of comes out about, uh, about this. Uh, and we just tried to provide a framework to why we think it's both possible and challenging um, and I think it suggests a sort of path forward. Thanks all of you for all of your time and for letting us share this first iteration of this paper with you. Thanks.